Welcome everybody to our Gardening for Wildlife class, part two. Uh, my name is Adam Spencer. I use he, him pronouns. I'm with the Clackamas River Basin Council. Uh, and joining me tonight is uh, my boss, Susie Cloutier, also from the Clackamas River Basin Council. Uh, and we have from the National Wildlife Federation, Morgan Parks. Uh, Morgan, giving a double wave there. Uh, and we have Christina Peterson, also on board with the National Wildlife Federation and Northwest Steelheaders Association. Um, joining us from the Backyard Habitat Certification Program, we have Antonia Picard, or Anya. Uh, Hi, everyone. Good evening. And then from the Soil and Water Conservation District, we have Lisa Kilders. Hello. And Nicole R. Hi. Great. And they will be uh, joining us in succession and we'll be jumping off and handing off to each other uh, like we did last time. I will advance the slide here. Uh, we went through that. Um, so I'll just have a quick uh, one, a uh, couple announcements before we start. Um, just talking about Zoom etiquette, I think everyone's been great uh, with keeping muted um, so we don't have any distractions. Um, and if you know, I, I can mute you if there is anything that comes up, so no worries. Um, also, if you'd like to turn your camera off, um, we can reduce the carbon footprint of our gathering tonight uh, because we won't have to stream all of that data and that will uh, mean less processors and then also free up some bandwidth um, we will be doing breakout rooms towards the beginning of this meeting tonight, uh, in which we will have each of you share about your ideal gardens. So you can screen share if you would like to share the drawings that you've made, or you can just hold them up uh, to the screen and just show and explain as you go. Um, so Morgan will go over that a little bit. Um, keep typing your questions in the chat as we go along, and we will collect them, and Nicole will. Um, bring them up for a Q&A about halfway through the program and at the end. Um, and we will be putting links in the chat as we talk about things. Um, and then like with last time, we will uh, make sure we send an email to all the registrants uh, with the link to this video recording, uh, as well as all of the links that we've mentioned um, and our contact information to stay in touch. Um, so with that, I'd like to uh, take a moment to acknowledge that uh, as many of us are joining from Oregon and Washington, um, that we are gathered on the unceded lands of many Native peoples. Uh, so please join me in acknowledging the many communities, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. Um, and by acknowledging that we have gathered on unceded lands, um, it demonstrates a commitment to begin the process of working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. We thank those who came before us for their stewardships of these lands and waters. So thanks for that. And now, Susie. All right. I feel like I'm I'm kind of always the, the harbinger of the bad news, but uh, we'll... Uh, talk a little bit about why we feel so passionately about native scaping and nature scaping, native plants. Um, a big one here is pesticides reduction. So I do want to um, uh, briefly tell you about what I do in the watershed. I do a variety of things with the council, one of which is working with um, uh, uh, sampling for pesticides uh, for the Oregon DEQ and several of the lower tributaries here in the Clackamas. So we look at a uh, I pull samples and flows out of um, certain subbasin creeks, uh, Deep Creek, North Fork, Deep Creek, Neuer, Sieben, and Rock. And I, we are uh, testing those for about 147 different pesticides and their constituents. And I just want to say that when I talk about pesticides, I'm really using that term as an overarching um, term for pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, insecticides. Uh, the whole gamut of those. So we are finding a lot of uh, several pesticides of concern in our watershed in particular, uh, which can be very 
nerve wracking because uh, this is the drinking water source for over 300,000 people here in the Portland metro area and commercial water treatment cannot afford to take all of these things out. So it behooves us to uh, get a grip on this stuff at the, uh, at the applicator stage. Um, and then we're also, my uh, uh, Clackamas River Basin Council and the Clackamas Soil and Water Conservation District, we're working on a collaborative uh, pesticide strategic plan to work with applicators in the basin as well to try to get some of these things down. So all that being said, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, pesticides here for a minute. So they're, they include some of the most hazardous chemicals commonly used in and around the home. Uh, so products that, like I said, that kill insects, weeds, bacteria, and fungi can be hazardous to children, pets, birds, fish, other wildlife, and uh, also obviously to the beneficial insects, bees, and pollinators, and ladybugs that we have around. So uh, pesticides used in the yard or at the workplace can be carried inside on shoes, on clothes, and mixed with house dust. They can come in on your kiddos, their hands, their bare feet. Uh, uh, they crawl around on the ground and put objects in their mouths, then inje uh, inject, ingest these chemicals. They can run around and they can be stuck to your pet's fur. So um, there are a million ways that those things can make it from outside to inside. So um, they kill aquatic wildlife, including our fish. So rain and irrigation wash pesticides off of yards and carry them into streams. Um, oftentimes in amounts that can harm salmon or the aquatic organisms that are their food. So remember that just like baby birds, um, salmon, uh, in particular juvenile salmon, eat aquatic macroinvertebrates, so they eat bugs. So you have a pesticide go into a waterway, it kills the bugs, and it kills everything that has to live off of that which eats the bugs. Um, the stuff also kills amphibians and other aquatic animals, too. yikes. Um, uh, for kids, in 2009, the United States Poison Control Centers had over, get this, 90,000 incidents related to acute exposures to pesticides alone. About 45% involved children under the age of six. Um, so if we think that our, our Tide Pods are bad enough, um, pesticides are worse. Um, pets, many pesticide products are toxic to dogs, cats, and other pets. The risk can be similar to the human health risks. Um, pets with access to treated landscapes may pick up pesticide residues on their paws and fur, licking it or tracking it into the house. And then uh, keeping in mind, I always mention that pets can die from slug bait. So if you're using slug bait, um, that's both tasty and deadly. Uh, bees and pollinators, most insecticides are toxic to beneficial insects as well. Remember that um, people always say, I want something that'll kill bugs, but only the ones that I don't want to live. And I said, well, a bug is a bug is a bug. So um, if it kills the bad guys, it's killing the good sides, the good guys too. And I want you to remember something called bioaccumulation, uh, which is what happened uh, back in the day with, um, <clears throat> with DDT and our eagles and osprey is that um, we used DDT, it got into our waterways and uh, it was ingested or absorbed into the fish stocks that these birds used as a food source. And of course, one fish isn't gonna make a problem, but the bird eats a lot and bioaccumulates the insecticide um, and it caused the fin shell uh, issues. So this is what happens a lot with our birds as well. Um, so we have to be careful of that. And then chemical persistence, I wanna talk about too. So we think that if we just stop using something, it's gone and we never have to worry about it again. But um, the longer a pesticide remains in the environment, the more likely it is to damage. So um, older products like DDT or get this still in the environment and in our, in our bodies 40 years after the last use was banned. So we're still finding DDT and it's degradates. Sometimes the degradate of a pesticide is worse than the pesticide as a whole. We're still finding that in our soils, bound to our soil particles and in our water. So since 2000, um, our water quality monitoring in the Clackamas Basin, uh, which was undertaken um, by the DEQ has detected pesticides that exceed accessible, uh, acceptable benchmarks that are healthy for fish and invertebrates in the Clackamas Tribs. Um, a great number of those pesticides found in the lower tribs are found in common yard care products as well as commercially used stuff. So it's not really 
just the big guys that are at fault. Um, and I want to, uh, you know, mention to you that when homeowners like you make the decision to stop using this stuff, you help ensure the long-term improvement of our watershed. Uh, so we are, uh, I just want to point you towards the picture here. I, I absolutely love this on the right. Um, I don't want my lawn to brown. So we're pretty um, hyperactive about using weed in feeds, which is a major no-no in this area. Um, we put on fertilizer and weed and feed and it, uh, we oversaturate our lawns or our yards with that, and it just uh, runs off into the waterways and kills fish. And also on the left-hand side of this graphic, um, the reproductive program, uh, problems that we get, miscarriages and reduced fertility, 150 million pounds per year, um, according to the EPA, is 150 million pounds of pesticides we're using a year. So we really need to knock it off. And we do have a lot of organic alternatives and um, obviously the alternatives we're gonna talk about today in this class. So uh, go ahead, Adam, to the next slide. Thanks, Susie. So neonics, um, short for neonicotinoids. Mm -hmm. So these are a specific class of chemical that um, became popular um, let's see, probably about 10 years ago now. Um, so neonicotinoids are derived from nicotine. They act on a certain kind of receptor in the nerve synapses. They are much more toxic to invertebrates like insects than they are to mammals, birds, and other higher organisms. Uh, generally, seeds are coated, and that's what you see here in the photo. Um, in the pesticide before they are planted in pots. And as the plant develops, the chemicals um, move into the leaves, the roots, the pollen, the nectar, um, and even the food products, um, if they're fruiting plants, uh, eventually made from, from that crop of seeds. So it's a systemic additive, um, meaning that it is within the system of the plant and found throughout the plant. Um, so if insects feed on any part of the plant, even water droplets released by plant leaves, the pesticide, the neonic, um, is, it's a neurotoxin and it can kill the, or it likely will kill the insect. Um, so in the case of honeybees, if the amount of pesticide ingested isn't strong enough to kill them, it can still cause impaired communication, disorientation, decreased lifespan, suppressed immunity, and disruption of brood cycles. Um, this is one possible um, link in the terrible um, chain of events with colony collapse that we're seeing in honeybee populations. Um, this entire class of chemicals has been outlawed in the EU, um, but not here. Um, and I did look this up before the presentation because um, some of my information was a couple years old and we found that they are definitely um, still legal in the US. Um, some of you might have heard of the big event that happened in 2013 in Wilsonville. Uh, this actually led to Wilsonville becoming uh, a bee city. Um, they basically, there was a Target uh, store. Um, the parking lot had some linden trees that had been sprayed for aphids. They used neonicotinoid um, treatment on the trees. Um, and then literally like the next day was Saturday morning, people were going to do their shopping and bees were falling out of the sky dead. Um, reports um, 25 to maybe 50,000 bees, all different kinds of bees, but largely honeybees, uh, a lot of bumblebees too, uh, potentially 150 colonies of bees. So obviously neonicotinoids or neonics really bad. Um, most uh, reputable nurseries today do not allow plants that have been treated with neonics. You can see in this photo um, in the upper left, you can see the, um, the little, little card that got included with the plant. You know, this plant has been protected with neonics from all these bad insects, but it's also an impact for all the beneficial insects that might be, be pre present as well. So, um, that's the skinny on neonics, they're really bad. So back to Susie. I'll actually share real quickly about our uh, pesticide-free and pesticide-wise program. 
um, that we have going on with the Clackamas Soil and Water Conservation District. Um, so this is a program we have um, where if you live in the Clackamas watershed, um, you can sign this pretty simple pledge um, and we'll send you a, a beautiful yard sign that Morgan designed. Um, so you can put it up in your yard and advertise to your neighbors that, hey, I don't use pesticides in my yard. Um, get them to think about using pesticides wisely or stop using them. Um, and uh, hopefully starting a conversation about how you all as a neighborhood can protect your watershed. Um, you can go to a uh, link I just put in the chat, mywaterway.epa.gov uh, to see which waterway you're actually in. Um, and then uh, you can go to this link here, uh, the parting with pesticides link to take the pledge um, and we'll send you these yard signs. Um, and I just wanna say, you know, we as an organization do use pesticides as do many, uh, Metro does, uh, many of the organizations that are managing a lot of these habitat areas. Um, and I was talking with one of the crews that we hire uh, to spray pesticides and they are all certified to use pesticide wise practices. Um, and they were sharing with me that when they're out there, they've encountered issues with people yelling at them uh, for spraying pesticides uh, and you know, people being upset uh, as we are when we see pesticides applied, um, if we don't like them. Um, and so, but you know, they're just the ones carrying out the work of removing invasive species often. Um, and you know, they're doing it in a way that is uh, certified to reduce the contamination of pesticides, like by not spraying on windy days or not spraying on days that are raining or you know, a few days before it rains again. Uh, so I just want to pass on a message from some, some of our crews, um, many of whom are uh, Mexican Americans, um, to please, you know, they're doing the good work for us. They're, they're removing invasive species. So if you're upset that uh, pesticides are being applied by Metro or other organizations that you are supporting as a con constituent, uh, bring it up with the organization and not, not the crews on the ground, please. Um, uh, so if you live outside of the Clackamas watershed, um, there's also this great program from Metro, uh, the pesticide free zone that they send you these lovely signs. Um, right now during COVID uh, and limited author office hours, they're not sending out the signs, um, but you can see what kind of uh, peace of mind a sign like that might bring when you bring your baby to the park. And as Susie mentioned, you know, the kids crawl around, pets roll around, and um, if there's pesticides, there are chemicals and poisons um, that are in, in the environment. So um, this is just a nice way to remind folks, again, when, when people start seeing these signs more and more, they start thinking more and more about pesticides and their purchases. Um, so uh, we encourage you uh, to look into these signs. Um, and there's also um, a, uh, program with Beyond Pesticides you can look into. So I'll share the link there. Um, and there's also, we have a link for the Victory Gardens of Tomorrow signs, um, which are really look cool. So those are another option. So uh, hopefully um, we'll see some of your pledges and we can talk more about how to reduce pesticide use in our watersheds. Thanks. Thanks, Adam. Um, so yeah, so a little more on um, chemicals. So sometimes these chemicals can come into our lives in sneaky ways as homeowners. Um, it could be you bought a new house and there's a, a shelf full of stuff in the garage. Uh, maybe you see a neighbor using something, as Adam was saying, maybe they're not doing it properly and it's, it's a blowing over in the wind or they're spraying over the line or I've even talked to people who've said oh my neighbor was trying to be friendly and came over and sprayed all the cracks in my driveway with Roundup or some chemical and OMG you know I didn't I didn't want them to do that and they were trying to be helpful but I really didn't want them to do that so anyway my point is just that sometimes these chemicals can come into our lives in various ways that are unintended and so um, it can be helpful to have a resource to look things up so the grow smart grow safe website um, this is what backyard habitat uses as our 
uh, rating system. So they do have a red zone, yellow zone, green zone rating system where they look at water, water quality impacts as well as human health hazards. Um, and so they go, you can look different chemicals up by brand name or ingredients. Um, and so it's important to know exactly what it is that you're looking at. Lots of different brands will have um, whole categories that may have certain names, but are slightly different product to product. Um, so you can look those up on this website and um, there's just tons of information on this website. It's out of Thurston County in Puget Sound um, and it's very robust with great detail. So um, I encourage you to check it out and, um, and just know that that is there for you as a resource when it comes up because um, it's easy for somebody to say, oh, this is an organic product or it's all natural or it's you know, safe for kids or pets or whatever. Um, but it's nice to not just have to trust them and to have an independent resource to look it up for yourself. So thank you. Um, okay, so uh, switching gears here a little bit, we're gonna move on to talking a little bit more about some stormwater management things. So why is lawn bad? Um, a lot of people were talking from the breakouts um, about removing lawn or reducing lawn. So yeah, um, stormwater management is a really big deal in the Pacific Northwest, obviously because we have very wet winters, um, pretty obvious to all of us, but that is really different from a lot of other places. Um, many locales have cold, dry winters, uh, but not wet like we do. Um, I, and then of course our native plants are adapted to the, these particular conditions. They are used to these really wet winters, um, which makes them really ideal for um, lots of different, um, different situations. So stormwater management actions that we can take in our yards are things like um, disconnecting downspouts from stormwater drains, so it's, it's good to look at your downspouts and see where they're going and what's going on. Sometimes um, different developments, different eras of house building will dictate what's going on. Sometimes there's um, proximity to a creek or a stream or a river. Um, some of the newer developments have um, French drain systems or other systems. So it depends a lot on your house, your development, the era that it was built. Um, but generally when we talk about disconnecting, we're talking about disconnecting from stormwater drains. Um, so, so often uh, disconnecting downspouts from stormwater drains goes hand in hand with rain gardens. So we talked about rain gardens quite a bit in the last uh, section in uh, last week. Um, so that can be a great way to work with some of these, um, you know, uh, floodplain, seasonally wet meadow kinds of plants uh, out in nature that we've adapted to our rain gardens and bioswales. Um, that's also a great uh, way to utilize, earlier we were talking about rain barrels and having an overflow. Oftentimes that overflow can be directed into a rain garden. Um, so water conservation is another great stormwater management action. Um, that just means reducing irrigation, maybe not watering lawn, um, being really intentional in how you do any irrigation early in the morning, late in the day, maybe using drippers, timers, that kind of thing. Um, also restoring soils by leaving the leaves and the woody debris. Um, we also talked about that some last time, um, just utilizing all of that natural debris to help re-nutrify the soil, um, which is really beneficial habitat for lots of ground feeding birds and amphibians and other creatures. Um, obviously two native plants, especially our large canopy trees are really adept at processing water. Uh, so Doug firs can process, um, let's see, I have this here, um, 800 gallons of water in a 24 hour period. Um, so really phenomenal at processing water. Um, and then re removing impervious surfaces. So in this context of stormwater management, we consider lawn an impervious surface because it has a really shallow root system and it really holds the water on the surface. So I'm sure you've been out in a squashy, swampy kind of uh, lawn area in the winter time. And that's really because that water is being held on the surface. Um, if it's a slope area, then that means that water is just flowing over really quickly as if it were 
a paved surface or an impervious surface. In the next slide, uh, you'll see some of these root systems that I've been talking about. So these are prairie plants. Uh, we, I can't find a, a slide that shows, um, a depiction that shows our locally native plants. But what you're seeing here is the root systems of these native plants in comparison to basic lawn grass. Um, on the far left, you see the lawn grass. And then the scale of this um, illustration is down to, I think it's 15 feet. So some of those really long root systems. Now these are just, you know, these are um, herbaceous plants. These are not shrubs and trees, but some of these root systems go down 15 feet. So really deep, robust root systems. Um, so uh, what are these root systems doing? They're doing performing erosion control. They are carbon sequestering. Uh, they're helping with water percolation and infiltration into the soil. Uh, they have diverse and robust root systems that have microorganisms that also process water and move nutrients around. Um, they also affect water turbidity. So they are in uh, streamside situations or even in streams, um, thinking of like rushes and sedges and some of those kinds of plants that are actually growing in the water. They help to clear, clean the water and clarify the water. Um, so obviously all these things add up to improved watershed health. Uh, there's no surprise that the plants that evolved here, our native plants, um, are, have an incredible ability to hold themselves in the ground uh, against these kinds of wet situations. Uh, a large biomass of native plants increases percolation. Uh, it enhances soil complexity, which further increases the ability to um, hold water. Um, and then um, we are in, let's see, enhanced by planting large canopy trees. So I mentioned um, the amazing amount of water that a dug fir can process. Uh, a more average large tree can process, uh, take up and process 100 gallons of water a day and discharge it in one 24 hour period. Um, so lots of benefits um, for stormwater management with these different um, native plants. Um, so after the next, next we're going to take a break and the amount of deluge that we get in this area, um, really we need to have, a, you know, our rain barrel plus an outfall plus an outfall for that. So each of our um, sumps or rain gardens also has a potential for outfall so that the water that comes up and over that and some of our larger rain events can uh, head out onto into a garden bed or um, head downhill somehow. So always have, always have three points of contact for that water, all of them leading to hopefully that reperking into the soil. Okay. So can um, I just add real quickly, Nicole? Um, there's some sort of urban myth that you need a permit or anything like that. And uh, we actually had a water rights specialist present to our board once and you don't need uh, permission or certification or anything for rain gardens or rain barrels. So you can go ahead and rain collect barrels. it. Yeah. Great. Good addition there, Adam. Um, so next couple questions are related to clover. So one of them is, um, when is a good time to plant mini clover? And along that lines, how can we change our lawn to clover? Well, is it St. Patrick's Day? <laughs> I don't have the answer on when to plant the mini clover, but I would say I've seen some um, eco lawn mixes through pro time lawn seed. I know that Anya mentioned that. And also I would recommend looking at the meadowscaping guide resource that we already shared. There are some really great site prep techniques in there. And I think that um, Anya also mentioned that you don't want to throw seed down just anywhere. You need it to be prepared or you could end up wasting a bunch of money. So you need bare soil. Yeah, I mean, I think with um, most of those seed mixes, like from ProTime, obviously I would ask them, it's probably gonna depend if it's like a sunny area or a shady area that might dictate when is the best time. And if there are trees um, that might dictate when is the best time to spread the seed. Um, I would follow those suppliers uh, suggestions 
Before All we right. go on, I have one more thing to say about rainwater harvesting systems. Yeah. Um, you don't need a water right as long as it doesn't hit the ground, but you may need a county plumbing, you may need a plumbing permit. And so check with the county to make sure because a lot of this rainwater systems, water is very heavy and you have to have it stable. You don't want it falling over and you don't want it sliding downhill and you may need a plumbing permit. So check with the county to make sure or your city that you don't have other permits that you might need to get. Good addition there, Lisa. Um, all right, moving along from Clover. Another question. So. Um, folks were mentioning things they still need help with for their plans. So I'm always looking for more help in planning a blank slate space or an already sheet mulched and aiming for a rain garden area. So the question is just help where to start. Is that right? It sounds like it. It's a prepped area that she was considering a rain garden in, but I don't know much more than that. Oh, a rain garden. Um, if you're planning for a rain garden, I mean, I would use the rain garden guide, which is in the resource uh, list. Um, that has great information about how to get started, how to plan it, how to design it um, with lots of examples and design layouts and plant information and all of that. Um, I personally love, I mean, if you're just in terms of designing space um, for a bed or a planting area or even pathways, I think it's really useful to use a hose or a rope to actually lay out and potentially kind of like mock up the space um, using pots or stakes or different things to kind of mock up the space with, you know, this could be a tree or this could be a shrub or, that kind of thing. I think um, for people who aren't used to visualizing um, and 2D from 3D from 2D, I think it can be really helpful to actually mock up the physical space. Um, I hope that answers the question. That's great, Anya. Um, so another question. My mother planted a long row of English holly that is now huge, 15 to 20 feet tall. I am not going to cut them down as they do provide a food source and nesting habitat. How big of a problem is that considered? Well, Anybody let me throw right out there that holly um, isn't invasive. It will spread easily because the birds do like to eat the berries and then they move around and spread it. And so I would recommend that you don't let it establish anywhere else as best you can. If you see little holly seedlings coming up, um, pop those out of the ground. You can do that pretty easily. Um, but actually getting rid of large holly is, is quite a project. It just, it just takes a lot of work. But holly also will restrict other plants from growing near it in the soil. So that's something to consider that if you're providing habitat, you're not going to be able to provide very diverse habitat for pollinators and wildlife if you just have holly. I monopolize that one. Uh, <laughs> let's see. We did have questions about sugar ants. Did anybody want to address that at all? So I will re I'll, I'll explain. Um, someone's been having an issue with sugar ants. The past year plus, they've been coming into the house at times. And this may seem off topic, but perhaps someone has suggestions for getting them to move on. I would contact the uh, OSU Extension, Cooperative Extension. They have entomologists there and they could probably um, help you figure out how to get rid of your uh, sugar ants. All right, um, we covered. So the other question that we had, we, we kind of tried to address where there are questions about folks that have trees, large trees, shade trees in their yard. So I'll read one of those out. Um, I have five dug firs and two redwoods in my backyard. I have brought in compost and I shred the needles and limbs and spread them over the ground. In the spring, the soil is loose, but by the end of summer, it is rock hard. What else can I do to prevent the soil from turning rock hard? Uh, 
Um, so I am going to talk some more about native plants at the end, um, but not get too deep in detail. But yeah, basically, um, it can be really easy for us to simplify to like, sun means dry and shade means moist. And obviously, it can be way more complex than that. And particularly these areas under large conifers can be very dry. Um, as, as I was saying, those dug firs can process a lot of water. Um, so yeah, uh, under large conifers in particular can be extremely dry. Um, and so there are native plants that do well in those situations. It can be, um, um, sometimes it takes a little extra care to get them established, but usually once they're established, they're good. Um, a lot of times those are plants that spread by rhizome underground. Um, off the top of my head, snowberries, um, birch leaf spirea, um, some of the ground covers that are, that are more rhizomatic spreaders like oxalis or inside out flower. Um, so those can be um, some of the best ones for getting established. And um, the more you have those root systems in there, the more kind of shade, shelter, um, mixed um, vegetation you have um, potentially, the more you can hold moisture in. Um, if I didn't talk about it last week, I was gonna to mention tonight about urban heat island effect. And I learned recently that the east side of Portland versus the west side of Portland is 15 degrees warmer in the summer. So temperature alone can really have a big impact on habitat as well. Um, th that is a specific to certain neighborhoods. And, and if you get into, there was a recent talk um, at Portland Audubon about uh, tree canopy and equity. And so we've looked at some of that, those issues related to um, some of those disenfranchised communities. But, um, but yeah, the, the temperature alone can have a really big impact. So uh, if you think about summer temperatures being around uh, high 70s or 80 in, in the, um, on the west side, if that's more like 95 on the east side, that is really harsh. So um, those are things to consider. So, so I am gonna talk more about plants at the end. And one of the things I'm gonna stress is resilient plants, plants that are tough and resilient and getting them off to a good start when you plant them. I hope that is good enough for now. That's great. I think we've covered everything now and you'll cover some more with the plants. We can move on. Now we're going to talk about pollination. So pollinators are animals that move from flower to flower while searching for protein rich pollen or high energy nectar, which is sugar to eat. Pollinators are essential to the food supply for people as well as for wildlife. As they visit flowers in search of food, they are dusted by pollen and move it to the next flower, fertilizing the plant and allowing it to reproduce and form seeds berries, fruits, and other plant foods that form the foundation of the food chain for other wildlife species, including humans. So pollination can occur by air, water, and organisms with agents like wind, rivers, insects, and birds. There are several types of pollination. Self-pollination occurs on the same flower or flowers of the same plant. Cross-pollination is between flowers on different plants. And then there's artificial pollination, which is by hand or man-made. Pollinators are critical for pollinating one third of our agricultural crops, the food that we eat, which amounts to between 235 to 577 billion US dollars, which just goes to show how important they are for continued life on earth. Next slide. There are many different types of pollinators in North America bees, butterflies, moths, and some species of beetles, wasps, and flies are pollinators, along with hummingbirds and two species of bat. Even people affect pollination through our behaviors, such as transporting seeds. An easy way to remember all the pollinators is just to remember the bees. Bees, butterflies, birds, bats, bugs, and behaviors. In the chat window, we'll put some additional tips for attracting pollinators. Next slide. One of the ways to attract specific pollinators 
is through flower petal colors. For instance, bees are attracted to violet blue colors while hummingbirds like reds and oranges. We also know that pollinators prefer dense clusters and clumps of the same plant. So be sure to plant in groups so they can see large landing zones of color. When you plant every other like yellow, red, yellow, red, yellow, red, even though it might look pretty and uniform, it's not natural. So always try to think of how mother nature would do it, which is often messy and chaotic, but teeming with life. So just remember that flowers clustered into clumps of one species in the same color will attract more pollinators than individual plants scattered through a habitat patch. Next slide. Other characteristics that attract different species are what's called pollinator syndromes. These are flower characteristics, traits, or cues that appeal to various pollinators. It's important to have a variety if you want to attract diverse pollinators. For example, bees don't see the color red. It's invisible to them as they see ultraviolet light. They also like landing platforms and nectar guides. So nectar guides are patterns like speckles, dots, or stripes on the throat of a flower. Short-tongued bees like flowering herbs, while long-tongued bees prefer tubular flowers. Beetles like odors and simple flowers with an open bowl shape uh, that are dull white or reddish in color. Flies like small shallow flowers in drab colors, think brown, purple, and with a bad odor. Butterflies are generalists and they like perching platforms. They like a light scent and composite type flowers. Moths like strong and sweet smells, flowers that open in the late afternoon and evening and clusters of white pale flowers that they can see in the dark. So in summary, if you're not seeing the pollinators you want to see, think about pollinator preferences when selecting plants for your yard. Next slide. This is a resource I like, which we'll put in the chat window, as it's a good reminder to plant blooming species that attract beneficial insects throughout the growing season. Overlapping flowering times provide continued forage throughout the year. As you can see, pink or red flowering current is getting ready to bloom right now, which some of you have been seeing in your yards. Others like Oregon grape, Oregon iris, and red osier dogwood will be blooming later this spring and something like Oregon Sunshine can benefit insects into the late summer. A new website that you should definitely check out is Oregon Flora. We'll put that in the chat window too. This is essentially a database of native plants, which you can filter by plant needs, plant features, growth and maintenance, eco region and habitat type. You can even search by what type of pollinators you're trying to attract. So be sure to check that out. Next slide. As bees are our most important and efficient pollinators and wild flowering plants rely on them for pollination and reproduction, it's important to create bee friendly gardens as we have over 4,000 native bees in North America. In the chat window, we'll share the Bee Sponsible Outreach Toolkit for municipalities uh, to help spread the word about the importance of bees, the challenges they face and the actions your fellow community members can take to help. Pollinators are declining worldwide due to various factors that um, several of us has mentioned already, including habitat loss, pesticides, disease, land use changes, and climate change. The once common rusty patched bumblebee, which was recently list listed as endangered in the United States, and the beloved monarch butterfly, which has declined by 99% in the West, are examples of species on the brink of extinction. To show your commitment to bees, display a pollinator sign, such as those from Victory Garden of Tomorrow, which Adam already mentioned earlier. This is a local Portland company that makes various attractive garden signs featuring pollinators and other wildlife. Another great option is the Xerxes Society's Pollinator Habitat sign, um, which is also very attractive. And one last thing to remember as far as bee habitat is to be sure to keep areas of undisturbed soil and grassy patches in your yard. As many bees build their nests either in the ground, in rodent burrows, grass clumps, dead snags, or rotting logs. And now we're going to learn even more about other beneficial insects from Lisa. Okay, so 
Tonight, we're gonna to have a crash course in beneficial insects. Next, please. I'd like to give a special thanks to Gwendolyn Ellen who, who put together the original um, presentation. She's retired from OSU Integrated Plant Protection Center. Next. So is this you? Do you just hate bugs? You just think they all should be dead? Well, I had similar thoughts too until I started learning more about them. They're actually very, very fascinating. And I think you're going to enjoy looking at insects a lot more after this. Next. So why do we want beneficial insects? Well, obviously these insects help control garden pests without the use of pesticides. Uh, the habitat that we create for beneficial insects are beautiful and they provide habitat for pollinators and other, uh, other birds. Um, and then we have the increased in beneficial insect populations and those uh, insects are eaten by birds. So we're providing food for birds. Next. So do you know the difference between garden pests and the beneficial insects? We don't want you to be killing off the good guys while you're trying to kill off the bad guys. So if you look on the left, you see the common uh, garden pests that we have, scales, uh, caterpillars, aphids, spider mites. On the, on the right side, you'll see some of our beneficial insects. You might know the uh, ladybugs, but you may not recognize the parasitic wasp, the tachinid fly, the hoverfly. Uh, you might know the ground beetle and maybe know the lacewing. They're a beautiful insect. Next. Okay, there are three functional groups of beneficial insects. The predators, they go through life gorging themselves on pests. Um, and they include uh, insects like ground beetles, aphids, um, not aphids, ground beetles, um, lace wings, hoverflies, soldier beetles, and um, ladybugs. Uh, and then we have parasitoids, the uh, parasitic wasps and the tachinid flies, and they lay their eggs on or in the garden pits. And it's that developing insect that the larvae that is the one that does the battle with the garden pests. Um, and later on, I'm going to show you some very cool um, video on that. So, and then we have pollinators, which we've already talked about. Uh, while pollinators are very necess necessary for uh, production of food, we're not going to talk about them tonight because they're not a natural enemy of our garden pests. With the exception of hornets and yellow jackets, um, and they provide very, very minor pollination benefits, but they will in fact prey on pests like grasshoppers and uh, caterpillars. So as much as we hate the uh, yellow jackets, they do a little good. Next. So predators and do need prey to survive. So we have to talk about the tolerance levels. Um, you have to have a good source of food for these beneficial insects to survive. So don't expect your garden to be insect free. Um, because when you do have a major outbreak of garden pests, you need your beneficial army ready to go and do battle. However, you must realize that control does not happen overnight. So uh, you have to expect that insect activity, good and bad, is in your garden. You also have to decide on your tolerance level when you do have a major outbreak. Look and see before you spray if you have beneficial insects present. And that, that requires some scouting. Best time to scout is between 10 in the morning and three in the afternoon. They don't like it when they are too cold in the morning and they, they go to bed early. So between 10 and three, be out there looking. Um, you can um, also then if you see them, don't spray. If you have beneficial insect activity, it takes them a while, but they will take care of it. If you have an outbreak that is so large, you just cannot possibly wait for the beneficials to take care of it. Use something that is going to be hopefully not so harmful to your beneficial insects. Use things that are listed for your specific insect. Don't use a broad spectrum spray and use uh, or use things like safer soap or prune out the insects, um, the branches that have the insects on them. Do some type of cultural thing to try to get rid of, um, of the insects if you can. So um, it's, it's just a good way to make sure that you're not killing the good guys with the bad. Next. So here is where our garden habitat is going to come into play. For the beneficial insects whose larvae attack the garden pests, you must make sure that the adults have food to reproduce. And those are the ones that use pollen and nectar. 
to give them the energy to lay their eggs and then the larvae are the ones that are going to do the work. And so this means you have to have flowers available from early spring to late fall. And if you look on here, if you see the ladybug on the far right, and just below that, that is a larvae of a ladybug. You might see aphids and think, oh my gosh, I got aphids, and now I have this thing that looks like from outer space, and I don't know what that is. It's probably another pest, but it's not. That is, um, that is a, an aphid I'm not an aphid, a uh, ladybug larvae, and they are murder on aphids. They will just gorge themselves. The same thing with the beautiful lace wing in the center, the larvae there to the left. Um, they, I think that one's called the aphid lion because they eat so many aphids. Okay, so let's go on to the next one. Parasitoids, where we've already talked about the, uh, the predators. Now we're gonna talk about parasitoids. These also need to have nectar and pollen to survive because the adults need that energy to reproduce and their offspring do, uh, do feed on the pests. Uh, the, uh, the one on the left, the parasitic wasp, they will lay their insect, their eggs inside the uh, insect, but the one on the right, the fly, the, uh, not the, parasite, the tachinid fly lays their eggs on top. So you see the caterpillar on there. If you see caterpillars, and they have these white things on them, the eggs, don't kill that caterpillar. That's where the, uh, the beneficial insect has laid its eggs. It's gonna kill that insect. And then that insect, those, those new beneficial insects will hatch and they'll go out and kill more um, bad insects out there. Next. Oh, yay, this is the fun part. Uh, this is another uh, time when you want to scout to make sure you have beneficial insects. If you have an aphid infestation and you see aphid mummies, then you know that you have beneficial insects there working hard. An aphid mummy are the bloated ones to the right. They're the bloated gray or white aphid bodies. If you watch this video on the left, that is a parasitic wasp. The ovipositor has the... Um, Stinger has evolved into an ovipositor and that unsuspecting aphid is having an egg inserted into it. Then that egg will start hatch and it will kill that aphid. And here is an adult uh, parasitic wasp that's going to emerge from that aphid body. Um, so if you'll see, sometimes they'll be white and gray um, here on the left-hand side, these finally gonna come out and these uh, full adults, so it will fly off to, uh, insert an egg into another aphid and kill that aphid. And all these videos are from Dr. Stephen Watt Rotten and he is the king of beetle banks from New Zealand. So he is also a very good photographer. Okay, next. So to be successful, you have to think like an insect. You want to, um, where would you go to get away from pesticides or soil disturbances? In perennial beds, that's a great place to have um, beneficial insect habitat because you don't dig up the soil every year. You're not disturbing it. They are clump grasses like fescue and miscanthus, uh, fountain grass or penicetum and switchgrass. They have good bases for insects to hide in and they're high and dry. They're, they're up off the ground a bit. They're perfect for overwintering ground beetles. You wanna make sure there's food. There's uh, some, some kind, uh, so there's a population of um, pests that are growing all year long. So you also wanna make sure you have something flowering to feed those adults that will um, produce the, uh, the uh, next crop of beneficial insects. And then you wanna provide water. Um, water is, uh, when we're talking about a water source, we're not talking about pools. I don't know how many of you have seen dead insects in a uh, pool it tried to land and drink, but they usually drown. Uh, bird baths, small divots in landscape rocks or saucers that are shaded and have water for even part of the day will work. Um, if you have a bird bath, be sure to add a branch that's large enough for insects or even a small bird to land on and they can work their way down to the water. That way they can safely drink. Some of these bird baths are beautiful, but they're smooth and they may not provide good footing, footing for the um, insects or the birds. Even sprinkling foliage in the morning, that foliage will be wet for a while and that will provide water for your beneficial insects. Here's something else to think about. I think, do we go to the next one here? Next? Yep. Something else to think about. In the fall, when we're a bit tired, we, we, we have already talked about planting for continuous spring through fall uh, flowering. Plant for a range of heights. Uh, you want to 
think like shrink down to insect size. Are there ground covers? Are there tall flowers and shrubs, mid layer flowers? Um, Want to have those different layers for different insects? And then because the beneficial insects that um, that do use the pollen and nectar are so small, you want to pay attention to the to the shape of the flower. They need to be small. And they need to exist in clusters. It's kind of like having a fast food restaurant on every corner. Uh, they won't have far to fly to get to the next food source. And so they're small, they don't fly very far. Uh, go for flowers that are flattish and have an easily accessible pollen and nectar. Tubular flowers are great for hummingbirds, but they don't offer anything for beneficial insects. Uh, next, and of, of course, grow in blocks um, that uh, we talked about before so that there's a number together and they can see them. Uh, so let's talk about plants. There are three main types of flowers that are most useful for beneficial insects. First is the carrot family. The carrot family have the humble flowers like this um, angelica here and they have many flowers close together so the small insects do not have to fly very far for their next meal. Mustard flowers, those are their eurysimums, your mustards, your arabis or rock crests that are beautiful early spring blooming flowers and perennial flowers actually in uh, rock gardens or garden borders. And then we have asters. They are of course asters or some sunflowers, uh, chrysanthemums, the daisy type of mums and marigolds even. And these are fall, summer and fall bloomers. So you have these types of flowers that are available for your beneficial insects and your different seasons that you usually see them blooming. The common denominator is a small, simple flower that has nectar and pollen, and that's very accessible to the beneficial insects that require those. Next. So go forth and make your garden beautiful and noisy with beneficial insects. Okay. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, mm -hmm. So we're gonna launch a poll real quickly. Now that you've uh, learned about some beneficial insects, uh, which beneficial insect would you choose if you could be one? Right, someone's uh, at the door. Ladybug, a parasitic wasp, which we saw in action, uh, ground beetle, or a lacewing. So some, remember, we also, Lisa also shared which flowers you would prefer. So don't just go for the cool parasitic wasp for the mummification, baby death eating thing. Uh, I bet some of those. flowers you like. I bet, yeah, I bet some of those lacewing lovers are, are uh, people with lace bug attacked azaleas and roadies right now. So those lace wings are gonna really help with the lace bug, the, the nasty one. Um, so I just wanted to give you guys a quick heads up. Um, we were going to finish here, but because of request from the previous part, uh, section last week, there was lots more interest in some more on native plants. And so we have added a couple slides. So I think we're gonna go just a few minutes over on our time, um, but this is um, to really uh, answer your request. So I hope this is beneficial. As beneficial as those <laughs> bugs. <laughs> Yeah, we tried to keep the polls fun tonight. You like yeah. that, Emily. Um, okay, are we done with the poll? Yep, go ahead. We had many lace wings and only a couple parasitic wasps. Okay, 39% lace wing, 35% ladybug, 17% ground beetle, and 9% parasitic wasp. I know, I just can't get behind the parasitic wasp either. They're just, uh, they're kind of creepy, I think. <laughs> um, the name ruins it for them. Okay, so a um, little more on the native plant stuff here. So let's talk about habitat zones and plant communities. Um, I wanna start here, cause I think, you know, as I was sort of saying in the Q and A after the break, it's a little more complex than just thinking about, you know, shade is moist and sun is, is dry. It, there's a lot more going on. So in these photos, these are all photos from our Portland metro area. Um, so those are some real life situations. Um, 
I want to really direct your attention and encourage you to look at the Portland plant list, which we've talked about before, um, and look at the plant communities section. So there's a whole chapter on the different plant communities. There are basically nine different habitat zones. Um, basically, these habitat areas have plant communities that are associated with them that evolve together. So those plant communities exist with um, different species that are used to growing together and, and have an association. So these different areas might include Douglas fir, Western Hemlock Forest, um, mixed deciduous coniferous forest, oak prairie, wetlands, floodplains, and rocky outcroppings. That's uh, some of them. These are based on conditions. So what you'll read about in the Portland plant list is based on conditions from the mid 1800s. And um, I feel like it may require us to have some kind of adaptive thinking about our current urban and suburban conditions. So when we think about things like um, pavement and reflected heat or pedestrian and canine traffic and that kind of abuse that our plants get, um, street clearances, uh, visibility, you know, these kinds of things. So um, kind of adapting some of those historic conditions and thinking about how it, um, our current situation applies. So one example we've talked about is wetland areas that we've adapted into our rain gardens and our bioswales. So that's one way of kind of adapting how um, a habitat area or a plant community might get utilized in our environment. Another one, um, we often think about a lot of this uh, forest land that was historically here in the Portland area. And I like to direct people to think about maybe the forest steep dry slope because the urban and suburban kind of woodland areas are so much drier because they're hotter, warmer, um, and just drier. So I think that's another way that we can kind of adapt one of these historic habitat zones um, and look at it through the lens of our current situation. Um, and then also, you know, there's urban heat island effect. I've just talked about that, the east side versus west side um, temperature differences, which I talked about earlier. Um, and then, um, you know, some people are looking at more Northern California plants, Eastern Oregon plants. That can get a little tricky. Um, I've certainly looked at some of those plants myself um, because we do have really, really wet winters. And some of those plants from those drier zones where there's more snow, um, or just drier climate, more arid climate um, are not adapted to the wet winters and they can suffer from rot. Um, so in the next slide, I'm gonna talk a little more specifically about conditions in your yard. Um, so these are all photos from my yard um, and you can see quite a bit of sun. I think that left photo must've been a shady or cloudy day because uh, that's a pretty sunny area too. Um, but you can see some situations, right? On the left, you see reflected heat potentially from the house. So that's stucco. So there's a lot of heat going to be reflected off the house. Um, in that middle photo, you've got another kind of little micro microclimate. Um, so ways in which we affect our situation, uh, affect the conditions through our activities. So I talked about some of the negative ones with um, pedestrian and canine traffic, things like that. But here, you know, I have a bird bath. I'm filling that on a regular basis. So that creates this moist area around that as a result. Um, and those plants are doing well, despite some really hot sun that's coming in there. And then in the right photo, you see a lot of uh, pavement and, and a stone wall. So again, a lot of reflected heat. It's a very hot location. Um, so it's really important to think about the bigger picture, but also, you know, even at the neighborhood scale, slope, flow of water, proximity to creeks, waterways, um, highways, um, things like that. And then, um, and then the, the more microclimate uh, situation of our yards, um, what are the situations in our spaces? Um, the different features around our yards. Uh, in the next slide, yep. Um, so again, these are all photos from my yard. So different kinds of plants that we might choose um, that are native as a substitute for a common ornamental plant. 
Uh, so some that I like to highlight are things like hydrangeas, uh, substituting a mock orange, which is a great native. Um, red flowering currant is a wonderful substitute for butterfly bush. Um, native spirea, we have two locally native spirea. I think the um, many people plant the japonica spirea, which has a pink flower. Our birch leaf spirea is very, very similar, but has a white flower instead. Um, a lot of um, feather grasses and ornamental grasses are really popular right now. We have some great um, fescues, Romer's fescue, tufted hair grass. Those are great native bunch grasses that really offer great um, habitat. Um, I think I had a picture there. You see our, my evergreen huckleberry. That's a great substitute for boxwood. Evergreen huckleberry can absolutely be hedged if you want to do that. Um, epimedium or coral bells um, substitute inside out flower or fringe cups, which you see in the middle photo. Um, also foam flower, there is a native hookera, the alum root or piggyback plant. Those are all really similar uh, related families of plants um, that look really similar to coral bells. Um, Pyrus or Andromeda, uh, that's a common uh, ornamental shrub. Uh, I love snowberry instead. Uh, you see my snowberry there blooming, um, and I can't believe how many hummingbirds are attracted to those little tiny flowers. Um, so I mentioned earlier, choose resilient plants um, that are the right plant for the specific location. Um, take into consideration, be realistic about how much care you're going to give them. Uh, perhaps consider uh, irrigation, even if it's for the first couple of years, just to help them get established. Um, Start off plants right with amendment, mycorrhiza, um, and definitely planning for some deep watering weekly for any trees or large shrubs. Um, I encourage people to plant the biggest tree they have room for, um, but definitely consider both the height as well as the breadth or the spread of the tree. Um, the Portland Plant List has great information on trees. Um, even the larger trees, they have um, not just a mature height and spread, but also a 10-year height and spread. So you get an idea of what it's going to be like after a little while, but not, uh, not, not mature yet still. Um, planting trees is a great way to also help um, create shade. And I think that creating shade is a great way to decrease maintenance in your yard. Um, in the second photo there, you see a mix of different native ground covers. Um, when you have more shade, uh, you can have these uh, dense plantings with lots of woodland uh, native ground covers. I love to use a mix of different ground covers that are gonna spread and fill in, create different bloom times throughout the season. Um, and then as the situations change, like for example, in that photo, you see the bleeding heart when it gets really hot in the summer, my bleeding heart completely fades away. It kind of melts away in the heat, but there's still other things that are there that are present that are filling that space. So it's not blank. Um, as many of you know, if you have a blank space, something will grow there. And so choose the plants that you want rather than let the plants just show up. And then I, I mentioned earlier, um, and I wanted to reiterate, if you do meadowscaping and you wanna have wildflower meadow, um, encourage you to start with fresh ground. Um, maybe it's sheet mulching this year and planting next year, but uh, don't just try to let the lawn go wild or throw some wildflower seed on top of lawn. Um, that doesn't work very well. Start with fresh ground and start with um, the plants that you want. Um, yeah, I think that covers I think I covered all of the things I wanted to say there. Um, yeah, and like I said, be, be realistic about the care you're gonna give and get those plants off to a great start. In the next slide, um, I just wanted to highlight, um, there are some great native plant um, resources. This is a poster from BES, Portland BES. Um, I love this poster because it shows the different canopy layers. So the trees at the top, uh, shrubs in the middle, ground cover herbaceous plants at the bottom, and then wet soil on the left and dry soil on the right. These are some of the most common uh, locally native plants. These are gonna be the plants that you encounter at nurseries. They're most readily available. And many of these are pretty adaptable as well. 
Um, so this is a great resource for you to look for. Um, if you sign up for Backyard Habitat, that comes in your resource packet, um, but you can look for it and get that free online as well. Um, and then also, um, before we switch to the next slide, I wanted to just shift gears really briefly and say that um, I think we would be remiss if we didn't also mention um, tech, which is traditional ecological knowledge um, for habitat restor restoration. This is basically indigenous knowledge. Um, this is really important understanding um, about around healing the land and nurturing our connection to land, um, to plants, to the animal world. Um, I would encourage you if you don't know anything about this, um, Robin Wall Kimmerer, and she is referenced in our resources. Um, she released a book recently called Braiding Sweetgrass. Uh, it really gets into some of the cultural context um, of indigenous relationship to the land um, and how that knowledge is really important for helping to heal the land and heal our connection to the land. Um, and I would encourage you to listen through her words of, about this concept, about this idea. Um, I did throw up a brief um, uh, YouTube video with her speaking around this and kind of explaining what tech is, that traditional ecological knowledge from indigenous people. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of talk about that um, in recent uh, circles around um, habitat restoration. Um, but if you're interested at all in nature from a philosophical point of view, definitely encourage you to check that out. Um, so that's all of the formal presentation. Um, I, we, we are going to talk really briefly about some of the certification programs. So in the next slide, Backyard Habitat Certification, that's who I represent here tonight. Um, so really briefly, there's a one-time $35 sign-up fee. That fee gets you somebody like me coming to your house to walk your yard, look at your yard conditions. We leave a resource packet with you with coupons and some of these resources like the poster I just showed you. Um, we write up a detailed site report based on the visit with plant suggestions specifically for your yard. After that, it's up to you to look at those five criteria, removing noxious weeds, adding native plant naturescaping, reducing or eliminating chemical use in your yard, adding wildlife stewardship and stormwater management features. Those are the five criteria. We encourage you then to just do what you wanna do, what draws you in, what is uh, appealing to you, what you feel like is most uh, urgent or important um, or interesting to you. And then when you're done um, with those initial steps, you might be ready to certify. A volunteer comes to your yard, uh, walks the yard, sees what you've done, might give you some more suggestions. You get to show off your work. Um, you get a certification sign like this sign here um, with some other benefits and recognition. And then we encourage people to renew or upgrade after three years. Um, since 2009, we've had 7,400 enrolled properties. Those are homes, schools, other community sites, some commercial sites. Um, that represents 1,800 acres. Almost 2,500 of those people um, have certified their yards and at least 115,000 locally native plants. And I say at least because we used to only track trees and shrubs. Uh, we are now adding all the native plants. So I think that we've only captured a, 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 a bit of, of what people have planted. We have expanded the program several times. We are now covering four counties. Uh, we go all the way out to Troutdale um, in Multnomah County. I go out to Damascus and Happy Valley in Clackamas County. We um, go over to Washington County now, um, Beaverton, um, Wilsonville, um, so all the way out there too, and then um, Clark County, um, and Clark County was a big expansion for us too last year. So um, hope you'll check it out and let me know if you have questions and we're going to go on to some of the other options for you guys. Thanks. And Anya, this is the maximum size for that is one acre, right? for backyard um, habitat? For private yards, yes, it is one acre. Sometimes on some of those uh, commercial or community sites, we, we have a little more wiggle room, but yes, one, one acre maximum. Thank you. Okay, hello everyone. You have not heard from me yet, um, but hang in there. We only have a couple slides left and I'm just going to talk to you about 
our Garden for Wildlife program with the National Wildlife Federation and the Association of Northwest Steelheaders. So two main goals of this program. Oh, Adam, go back one. Uh, two main goals of this program is to help wildlife and help people. And it has been around for over 50 years. Okay, next slide. Okay, so to become a certified wildlife habitat, as you can see, many different places can be certified. Yards, balconies, museums, farms, places of worship, really anything counts. You just need those five easy requirements in that top right corner, food, water, cover, places to raise young and sustainable gardening practices. Um, and we have a lot of resources on the website that Adam is linked in the chat. So feel free to go check that out. Um, and so with our certification, it's a little bit different from the backyard um, habitat certification where we don't have any acreage size requirements. We don't have site visits. Uh, your certification never expires and it's a more simplified process. So what we like to say is this is a great first step if you want a baby step before going on to backyard habitat. Uh, but you can do both certifications if you want. You can pair this with any certification. Um, in the chat, we mentioned a lot of different signs. So if you find different signs, different certifications, you can mix and match and find what works best for you in your yard. Okay, next slide. Okay, so what does it mean to certify? So it is $20 to register, $30 for a sign, but during May, we take $10 off. So that means you are only paying $40 during May for certification and a sign. But since you are part of this class right now, if you are interested, feel free to email me at orhabitat at nwf.org and we will send you a sign for free. That means that you're only paying $20 to register which I think is a great deal. Um, they're really great signs. Uh, so feel free to reach out to me. We'll put that email in the chat and you will also find it in the follow-up email and your resource document. Um, and so what's great about our program is like I showed you a lot of different people can certify and um, we have 741 people that are certified in Portland, Oregon and 60 of those are schoolyard habitats. So we really like to work with schools um, and there's a lot of great ones out there that have created awesome gardens and um, have gotten a lot of certifications. So again, my email is orhabitat at nwf.org. All right, so that was kind of the very brief overview of the program, but feel free to go to those links in the chat and you'll find more detailed information. Okay, next slide. All right, so we have reached the end. Yeah, I've actually got two uh, lingering questions I wanted to bring up real quick. Um, one was, what about using soil conditioners like gypsum and maybe sand to lighten up the soil beneath conifers with hard ground? Well, be very, very careful with sand. If you use something too fine, you're just going to have concrete. All right, we might not have much more of an answer on that one right now. Um, one other question I saw in there was, can you suggest a substitute for a long, thin evergreen, such as a beanpole yew? I just threw up an answer to that. Um, depends on what they're going for um, and size, but um, I suggested maybe tall Oregon grape or evergreen huckleberry if evergreen is a key there. Um, yeah, they can both take some pruning and they're both evergreen. Great, those are the only two lingering questions I saw that we hadn't answered. So we're open to any other questions. If you wanna throw those in the chat. Well, while people are lingering to ask their final questions or 
um, heading out, uh, we just want to thank everybody. Uh, and thank you so much to our presenters with all this amazing information. Um, we're really happy to see uh, such great feedback um, and your gratitude for the presentations. Um, again, these are recorded, so you can please share these with your friends who are also interested in gardening. Um, we'll share an email with all of the links. So you can forward that as well. Um, and uh, here's just a sample of all of the links that we've talked about, but there's a document that you'll have access to that has so much more information. Um, and of course, uh, get in touch with us um, because we would like to continue helping you create habitat to help our wildlife. Uh, so just sharing our contact information again uh, from the Clackamas River Basin Council, uh, Susie Cloutier, uh, Susie at clackamasriver.org, from the National Wildlife Federation and Northwest Steelheaders, Morgan Parks and Christina Peterson, uh, and from the Clackamas Soil and Water Conservation District, Lisa Kilders and Nicole R, and with Backyard Habitat Certification Program, Antonia Pickard. So uh, thanks again. Um, if you'd like to join, we have an ongoing Journey Down the Clackamas conference where you can learn about our watershed. Um, so we'll send a link to that. And the next event is April 6th at 6 p.m. And we'll talk about the geology of the Clackamas Basin. Um, and with that, uh, just again, thanks so much. And it uh, looks like we are about to close up here. So have a great evening. Good everybody. night, everybody. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.